start. So um, it works. Everything's good. All right. Uh, so first things first, um, I know that you kind of take pictures of the important slides of the presentation, and that's good. Uh, you need to take only one picture out of my presentation because I prepared a special page for you. Uh, what? On, what's going on here? Sorry about that. Um, Jeffrey.com slash show notes, you go there, you will find there, and now my clicker doesn't work. You'll find there the slides, they're already there. You find there the video uh, once it's being uploaded. Uh, all the links for a bunch of stuff, uh, comments, ratings, and a little bit raffle for you to thank you. Um, on the bottom of every page, you have the link again in case of you forgot. Um, and uh, this is me. That describes more or less what I do. Uh, my name is Baruch. Uh, I'm head of developer relations with JFrog, and we do awesome t-shirts, awesome stickers, and uh, pretty good software as well. Um, my Twitter is at jbaruch. You should follow me right now because, as you guessed by now, I'm a super entertaining guy. If you are still not sure, I have my Twitter handle on each and every slide because later you were like, oh, this guy is good, and boom, the Twitter handle is right there. That's the idea. Um, and uh, I'm very proud um, to be CNCF ambassador and speak with you about all stuff, DevOps and cloud native, Kubernetes and what's not. So today we're going to talk about a very sad story. Clover's children who have no shoes. It's really heartbreaking. And it goes like that. Let's start with a poll. How many of you are software engineers? All right, okay, the majority of you. How many of you are optimists? Same people, nice. Uh, how many of you are self-confident and kind of feel that they know what they are doing? Same people, very good. Well, and here is the thing. I will explain what we just saw. <laughs> so optimism is actually a psychological effect. And uh, it's um, when people suffer from illusionary superiority, uh, when they actually think that they are good but they are not, that's optimism. <laughs> um, Self-confidence is also very interesting. It's called uh, second system effect. We, are talking, we, we, we spoke a lot about books today, so there is another classic book that you should read from a... Uh, Brooke, what's his name? Oh my God, shame on me. Horrible with names. A classical uh, software engineering book that it's called The Mythical Man Month. Uh, Man Month. And um, there is a paragraph there about what we call the second system effect. And it goes like, okay, my first system was so good, I'm going to kill it the second time. And then it's basically a recipe for disaster. So this is us, this is software engineers. Uh, like non-well-established optimism and uh, basically uh, overconfidence without any reason. It goes for all of us and that's okay. Uh, what happens is that we have some con uh, consequences out of it. Um, that's a Venn diagram. <laughs> I guess most of you will agree with me. Maybe you have the software that you work on that you want to declare an exception. It's not. Um, another confidence is this. Uh, well, you know how it works. Um, your managers ask you how are you doing, and it will. Pr the answer probably will be it's 80% done, <laughs> right? And then it's 80% done for for 80% of the time. <laughs> Sunk cost is another problem. When we start do something and we feel that we are very good and we are very very close, it's almost it's always fine. It's very hard to give up and, and realize that, okay, it wasn't as good as we planned and we really should give up. So it's hard to give up, that's another problem. And here's another teaser for you about something that we are going to talk about today. Um, that's a real world example of breakdown of customer defects that came to support in a project led by a very good friend of mine, Leonid Yolnik, who contributed a great deal to this content. 
So um, you see here that most of the tickets, 65%, are Severity 1 and Severity 2. What do you think about Leonid's project? He's not here, so you can... It's pretty shitty, right? Not very good. Okay, we'll get back to that. And when we are going to talk about the importance of data, just remember this picture. It looks very good. We actually did some nice, uh, uh, you know, uh, measurement. We took the numbers and that's the result. But we'll get back to that. First, let's start with this picture. What do you see here? Scrum, right, stand up meeting. Every morning we do that. Why we do that? Because we want to understand where we are standing. Here is where most of the people will tell that they are 80% done, right? <laughs> this, is, this is the occasion. And you already understand how reliable this data is. So let's talk about how departments measure. So every department, they have their own tools. Sales probably do Salesforce, and marketing probably do Marketo, and then support probably do Zendesk or whatever, and then finance do NetSuite or whatever, HR have Workday or whatever. What do engineering have? Anecdotes from stand-up meetings. <laughs> now, this is a problem not only for engineering. This is a problem for entire organization. Because when you have proven numbers, when you have solid data, collaboration occurs. People speak with each other. When you come with anecdotes from daily stand-ups, not so much. So it's kind of, you know, everybody are talking and arguing with numbers, and engineering is like eating glue. <laughs> So, as I told you, it's a very, very sad story, and we do have a problem. Now, unfortunately, I wasn't able to connect the audio here because we did a really short setup, but the following clip has uh, subtitles, so read the subtitles. Oh, sorry. Here we go. What if we take emotion out of the process and base it on empirical metrics? Then we are really making decisions. The data is. So we can hurt our friends' feelings without taking any responsibility? <laughs> Me like it. <laughs> so what just happened is amazing. Actually, it was kind of a live demo that I expected to fail and it worked. Optimism, you remember? This is that. <laughs> right, so, um, uh, okay. So, um, this is what we want to achieve. We want to uh, hurt our friends' feelings without taking any responsibility because the data is speaking, right? We don't need to convince anyone because we have the metrics. So let's talk about metrics. And this is not new, obviously, and you, I'm sure, know engineering metrics from the pre-DevOps era. If we we're, talk we we're talking about the development, they had uh, the velocity, the burn down charts, they had architecture metrics like complexity and this kind of stuff, and compliance like, you know, licenses and, 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 and security and all that. Ops, they had their own metrics because they were separated from dev, and these metrics, the most important one is uh, obviously uh, uh, SLA, but also cost on environment setup, uh, average customer cost, tool stability, this kind of, so they, lay, they were living in their own silo, they had their own metrics. And QA, the same, right? So they had the number of incidents, the, the severity of the defects, the mean time to repair, the code coverage, the test suit stability, all this stuff was always there. So this is like, you should realize most of them. But now we are in DevOps. So if we take all these three colors and blend them together with this, this ugly brown color, and the real question is, what are the metrics that now apply to DevOps? What? So we have this huge metric called velocity. That is the main metric of all the agile movement, right? It's in the core of it. So what is to uh, to, to DevOps like Agile to, velo to uh, like Velocity to Agile. What is this main metric? And it looks like profit is a good merit.
because we are talking about everybody are coming together, working together towards one goal. And usually if we talk about for-profit organizations, the goal is profit this way or another, right? And then obviously the software engineers, they um, add to profit by creating uh, something that can be eventually be sold. And the ops contribute to profit by making that available to the outside world and reducing the costs of running it, etc., etc. And QA obviously contribute to profit by discovering defects and making the quality better. And generally it looks like everybody worked toward this profit, which makes it a little bit like velocity for, um, for agile. It's very easily understandable and it creates this unity of everybody works toward the same goal. There is a third column which is coming. Okay, so the previous poll what worked exactly as I designed. Let's try this one. Who knows what velocity is? Okay, we're starting very, very hard here. Okay, keep your hands in the air whoever knows what velocity is. Who knows what burn down chart is? Same hands, keep them up, keep them up, that makes sense. Who knows who has a burn down chart in their organization? Now when you take hands down, okay, so we end up now in one, two, three, four hands, oh my God. Uh, who looks at the burn down chart in their organization? Uh, okay, same hands, good, 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 good. Who trusts the burn down chart? <laughs> After what I told you about how trustworthy the anecdotes from this daily stand-ups, uh, one hand, which is also like, ah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, and the real question is, who knows what to do if it doesn't look right? <laughs> you, okay, we have one hand. We need to talk. Uh, right, so what is the problem? The problem is that this burn-down chart and this velocity thing is not really actionable, right? So, okay, so our velocity is falling, now what? We need another matrix that will help us to understand what went wrong and how to fix it, and it's the same with profit or any other like top level metric. So, the profit is failing, what's going on? We need more fine grain metrics. This one is two cores. And that's because this picture of DevOps is two cores. Right, I would say there are two ways of doing DevOps, the Netflix way and the human way. Um, and and this, is, this is the Netflix way. This is where you hire the best talent in the market, who are by definition superheroes, and they in the same time are best coders in universe, uh, they know Kubernetes as they wrote it, and also they, they can design the most complicated QA plan and then completely automate it, right? The problem is the pool of superheroes in this planet is limited and they all already work for Netflix. <laughs> so for the rest of us, there is a specialization. There are, there are definitely people who are better in development than in operations or in QA, and this is DevOps if you are not Netflix, and as we just figured out, you're not. <laughs> so we have common goals, common tools, common culture, but we still have this deep specialization, each and every one in different areas. And then we interact with each other, right? Those all of them are interact and actually affect each other. This is DevOps. Now the same is metrics. We do have this shared metric. It can be profit or anything else. And then we have specialized metrics that also interact with each other, affect each other, impact each other. So let's uh, look at, um, at some examples of those collaboration, this collaboration between metrics. So that's kind of, that, that's a table, and we have here two sides. One is influenced by, who, who actually uh, um, influenced this metric, and then who is affected by this metric. So let's start with what op does that affects dev. So for example, um, time to build. Time to build is influenced by ops, but affects obviously Dave, 
release pipeline stability, artifact replication topology, whether you have the best artifact repository in the world, um, obviously JFrog Artifactory, guys, I just paid for my trip here. Um, actually, it's a decision or, or it's um, ops have the ownership, but it obviously affects each and every developer in how fast they can move, right? And another example is what's influenced by QA. So false reopen count. If QA constantly keep uh, reopening issues which are not the issues, it slows down the development, right? And uh, coverage, uh, the same. Let's look at another one. Average cost of customer is influenced by the development. The quality of their code have a direct effect on how uh, much hardware we need to throw on this code to run to serve a number of, uh, number of customers. And it, of course, affects ops who are in charge of this budget. Smoke test quality. If our smoke tests are bad, it means the QA didn't do a good job, ops are going to suffer in their release pipelines, right? So they're, they're all interconnected. And if the dev uh, have a very huge velocity of incoming de uh, defects, for example, the QA suffers and cannot work. And the other way, the ops that, uh, who are in charge of creating QA labs uh, also affect, also affect the, the QA. Right, so this is kind of a example of how metrics collaborate and it has obviously direct impact on how people collaborate. Because if what you are measured by is influenced by other teams, you have to work with those other teams. So the next part of the presentation I called cooking with metrics, and I will do a lot of food analogies here. Some of them are plain ridiculous, but bear with me. That's what I managed to come for. And we'll start with metrics categorization. We'll start with categorizing the metrics. So first, we need to understand why we are measuring. And there are a couple of different goals. The first goal is return of investment. Is the activity that we are doing is the right thing to do. Why people are in line in front of this restaurant, and that's the first McDonald's in Soviet Russia in uh, 1988, and my sister is somewhere there. Uh, why people are in line on this restaurant and not another restaurant? Are we doing the right thing? Continuous improvement. We did something and ended up like that. What do we need to measure so next time it will be better. And trust. That was a hard to find a good analogy in food. Those are actually the testers that test the food of the king so he won't be poisoned. Uh, I know. Uh, so the trust is, can I come to a decision maker and say, I have enough data to ask you for a decision and get an approval based on this data? So that's the trust. Now, let's see how those goals correlate to how we actually measure. So first type of measurement is sampling. Sampling can be done, for example, for a complete sample. If you go to a supermarket and you pick five oranges, you will look at each and every one of them to make sure that those are good oranges, each and every one of them. And we need sampling if we want to see if we are doing, we need a complete sample if we want to predict the future based on it, right? If I want to know that I won't be poisoned by those oranges, I need to review each and every one of them. And here's, for example, that's an example of, uh, of, of a complete sample. First of all, tools, you remember, are important. And this is obviously a very, very sophisticated tool that not a lot of you will be able to master in their lifetime. It comes from this wonderful company, and it's called Microsoft Excel. 
Um, now, killing us, but joking aside, it is a good tool for obviously doing uh, data because it is a good tool. So here is an example of engineering effort allocation on a, on a certain sprint. And you can say that, okay, the goal of this sprint was producing a big feature A. And from the daily stand-ups and from the, what your people are saying, they work very hard on this feature. And you feel like, how many percent were investing in this feature? 80%, of course. But then you actually look at what people are doing and you discover that what it is, 30% only is actually spent on big feature A and the majority is spent elsewhere in this example, 34% on keeping the lights on. And that means maintenance, bug fixes, libraries updates and this kind of stuff. And this is amazing because if you didn't measure, you're sure that 80%. Representative sample is in another type of sample. And this actually measured, this measured not of all of them, right? So when you take a temperature of whatever is cooking, being it cookies or, or meat, once in a while you check one cookie or one steak and you draw conclusions out of it. You do it over time, but you don't need the entire sample. Right? So how effective we are can be measured with samples. But they should be good, they should be representative. If I have a cookie which is in a very far edge of my, uh, how do you call it, uh, cooking, uh, whatever it is, plate, then probably its temperature won't be representative enough. And they need to be collected over time because I want to know the fact that my meat is isn't done yet now, doesn't mean that I can go to sleep because it will never be done, right? I need to measure again soon enough to build a trend. So this is good to measure how effective we are and to do this continuous improvement, right? So for ROI, we need a complete sample. For continuous improvement, we need samples over time. For predicting the future, we actually need both. We need to have the complete picture over time, and only this way we can build this trust and predict this future, and I will have an example for you in a minute. So now let's talk a little bit about examples, and for examples, we need a real Scrum team, and you probably recognize those guys. Those is Scrum Team Avengers. They are, as you might guess, very good, but they struggle as well. Let's talk about their struggle, and how data-driven DevOps helps. So one of the anecdotes from the daily Scrum stand-up is we never get enough testing environment from ops. And QA is suffering, the quality is suffering. We need those uh, QA environments, but they're always busy. So first, we gather some data. We take this mighty tool that I spoke about, Microsoft Excel, and actually, plot down the environment utilization. So you can see here we have 10 environments. And you know what? It looks like the guys are right. Most of the time, all the environments are fully utilized. And if you need more, you don't have them. So that doesn't look good, but let's ask why. For that, we need to look for more data. And that will be how many days people are holding those environments. So if you can see here that Raj is fine, Jen is fine, Christina is okay, Helen, Lee, Baruch, uh, everybody after Baruch I would fire right away. Uh, you see the problem, right? People check out those environments, never check them in. So once we have the data, we can do the continuous improvement. What's the continuous improvement that can be done here? Automatic check-in, right? After three days, your environment is checked in back. Now first, a good manager that acknowledges there is the problem, solves the problem by increasing the budget and creating more environments. So you can see here, we, uh, first we started with 50% more environments. Take 15 now. 
And we can see how immediately all the 15 were taken exactly as all 10 was taken. But then, once we implement this auto check-in, boom, it suddenly drops. And not only we can get back to 10 environments, we can actually save money. We can go down to uh, what it is, like 6, first to 8, and then to 6, and still have plenty of environments available. Another anecdote. Tests are failing because the test suite is not stable. QA makes our build fail without reason. Anyone familiar with that? Obviously. What can we do? We need to start measuring. And the first measurement will be, is it true? Is it true that a lot of our issues that are reopen of quality are because unstable test suite environment? And the easiest way to capture that is creating a new issue type in Jira. So we created a new issue type, test suite stability, and now every time this is the reason, we will just uh, we will just fill it here, file it here, and then we can look if that's actually the case, and if that's actually the case we can start fighting it. We can start pay attention, we can start add resources, and then we can see the return of investment. We can see here that if we really pay attention, we can fight it because it's not very different. It's not very difficult. It's very easy to do once you know what the problem is. And the third example is the trust. So uh, those developers want to deploy a new garbage collector. It's tons of work without any profit. Uh, well, that's a reasonable claim without data. But if those developers run tests on their staging environment, and they can show that their old garbage collectors, the G1 and the CMS, produced a certain latency, but then when they want to implement the Shando one, the, there is no, almost no latency at all, this is something that the ops engineer can trust, can invest, and then suddenly get the return of investment. So that's like, that's a, this story is actually a real story from uh, one of the social networks in, in, in Russia, which is almost as big as, as, as Facebook. And you can see here, this is their implementation of the new garbage collection. This is how it affected them, and that was amazing. But first, you need to prove that this effort actually worth doing, and you do it with data. So um, finish up with some do's and don'ts. Measure the right thing. Right, knocking on the watermelon probably is not how you measure, or it is, and I just don't know how to do it. But uh, let's take some example of measuring the wrong things from our world. What is the most ridiculous metrics in software engineering? Lines of code, thank you very much. That's absolutely a bullshit, and when you, me you measure, you need to remember what is the right thing to measure. Avoid data overload, right? You now got excited with my talk and you run and start collect all kinds of metrics. Uh, and then you just drawn into it and it doesn't really make any sense. Measure what's important. Use reliable data. We spoke about it. Data that we collect should be reliable, otherwise it's worse than not having any data. If only one developer reports the right issue type in Jira, you have some data, but it's completely unreliable, so don't use it. Common vocabulary is important. When we speak about, um, when we speak about different types of metrics, we need to be very precise of what we are doing. And my favorite example here, this is medium in Brazil, this is medium in Russia. It's both called medium, not exactly the same meat. And my favorite, metrics generate incentives and incentives change behavior. Remember that before you start measuring. People will act to fulfill what you want to see and sometimes that's not the action that you 
actually want. Last, uh, last um, or one before last advice is tweak as you go. You remember we put a huge effort on test suit stability and in some point of time the graph went flat. No more issues. Once there is no more issues, we don't need to check it every day now. We can check it once a month, we can check it once a, qu once a quarter, just to check back that the problem didn't come back, but we can tweak as we go of what we actually measure. And you should elevate to avoid data overload. Raw data, like commits on, 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 uh, on GitHub, product-specific dashboards, like the dashboard of Jenkins when you see number of builds that are falling or, 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 uh, or passing. And then when you really got those levels set up, you should, you should actually elevate to integrated dashboards. One of the examples, but not the only one, is the recognition control, which connects all the tools from, uh, all the data from different tools and show you one dashboard. Remember that? We decided that Leonid didn't do a very good job. This is a great example of not enough data. So instead of shouting on, on his, uh, um, uh, his engineers, and he is VP of engineering, so those guys report to him, he actually measured the same t t tickets on different scale. And this scale is how the issue was resolved. And he discovered a wonderful thing. 52%, more than a half, all, all the tickets didn't end up in a code fix, but information provided. It turned out that the problem was not with the product quality, but with not enough information available to the support engineers that opened Severity 2 and uh, Severity 1 and Severity 2 tickets instead of doing other things. So instead of investing tons of time and money in trying to improve the engineering quality, which wasn't an issue at all, he just spent much less in educating the support people and actually got much better job. So what we actually need to do here is get data and then make the collaboration better. Data-driven life removes blame game, builds accountability and trust, creates common base for discussion, and that's more or less all. I'm Jay Baruch on Twitter still. This is DevOps Day Singapore. Data-driven DevOps is the right hashtag to use on Twitter when you praise this talk. And jbaruch.com slash show notes is where you can find everything. Thank you very much. Thank you. Who needs lunch? Just let's do questions all day. You, you have a great hat. You, you need to tell us where did you get it. Oh yeah, that's a special order, and this shop went out of uh, out of business. So. <laughs> Limited edition. So we'll only take one question. Uh, I'll still remind people that we have the open spaces where we can talk about da data-driven DevOps for a full hour. And I will be there. So. We hear different team names such as DevOps Test Center, Performance Engineering, Chaos Engineering, and Command Center. I'm sure all of them are vital in SRE model. How are these pieces managed together in SRE journey? Well, that has nothing to do with what I speak about, with what I talk about, but hey, I can answer that as well. Cool. Uh, yeah, so all those, all those different names and all those different teams, starting with the ridiculous stuff like DevOps engineer and DevOps team and all this stuff is actually, from my perspective, is the site reliability engineering, right? This is where the, the biggest tooling change and I would say people's skills change come uh, when we talk about our DevOps journey. Obviously, mindset should have changed for everybody and processes should change to everybody, but the people who change the most are the system admins who become SRE engineers, and I would again, in the spirit of repeating the same books all over and over again, will um, refer you to uh, Matt's keynote this morning uh, and the um, SRE handbook or whatever it is from Google, um, DevOps uh, handbook, obviously, and uh, th those books have a lot of good uh, content about how to build 
this team that we are not sure what the right name is for. Thank you, Baruch. I'll uh, see you. I'll see you in the open space. Yes.